Welcome to All Bodies on Bikes, the podcast, where all bodies are good bodies, all bikes are good bikes, and all rides are celebrated. All Bodies on Bikes is a movement to create and foster a radically inclusive bike community. So join your hosts, I'm Ellen. And I'm Marley. As we explore the complexities of the biking world, help us break down barriers and create the world that we want to see. And don't forget that all bodies really means all bodies, not just larger bodies, but bodies of all sizes, ages, races, abilities, genders, sexualities, and beyond. Come along for the ride. Hi friends, Marley Blonsky here, Executive Director of All Bodies on Bikes and your podcast co-host. I've got some really exciting news for you. Our fall fundraiser for All Bodies on Bikes is officially live and we need your help. We're trying to raise $10,000 to keep growing this incredible community, making cycling accessible to everyone, no matter their size, shape, or experience level. Your support today will help us fund more inclusive events, offer more resources, and spread the message that all bodies truly belong on bikes. And as a special thank you, anyone who donates over $50 will get our custom All Bodies on Bikes X Gooder sunglasses, which are really fun. They're named the hottest thing on two wheels. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on these incredible sunglasses. So head on over to allbodiesonbikes.com to donate and please share with your friends. Let's ride together and make this movement bigger and better than ever. Hello there, Ellen. Hey, Marley. How are you? I am doing so well. How are you? I am so good. Thank you so much. Can I share a really funny story with you before we get into today's interview? Yes. So I'm at my mom's house. She lives across the country from me and she's watching my dog for about a month. And I walked into her house today and I hear my voice blaring throughout her entire house. I'm like, <laughs> what is happening right now? Turns out she has been listening to the podcast with my dog to try and trick my dog that I'm in the room somewhere. <laughs> that is fantastic. I, first of all, I love that she does that to begin with. That's such a smart idea. Oh, my daughter runs a podcast. I'll just chuck her voice onto the stereo. But is Daisy May, does she buy it or does she start to look around for you in the house? I think she is deaf. So I don't think it it's working, but my mom is convinced it's working, which is what really matters. <laughs> Daisy May is, she has like serious separation anxiety. So I don't think anything would work, but it's a good effort. And it's giving us a lot of listens, which I will never complain about. First of all, bless your mother for just wanting to feel like she's doing anything else to help Daisy may be comfortable. And I'll say too, if half of our listeners are actually dogs, I am okay with this. Me too. Me too. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Why don't you introduce our guest today? I'm super excited to talk to her. I am too. I have a previous whole career in sustainability. And so I'm really excited about this conversation. Jackie Francis is our guest for today. And she is a renowned climate scientist and the founding executive director of the Global Warming Mitigation Project. Earlier this summer, Jackie embarked on an incredible 600 mile bike ride from Salt Lake City to Sun Valley, Idaho and back. Her journey aimed to raise awareness for climate action and to promote sustainable travel, demonstrating that long distance biking is not only feasible, but also a powerful statement against carbon intensive travel methods. Welcome to the show, Jackie. Thank you, ladies, so much for having me. It's great to have you here. Thanks for being here. I want to know a little bit about you and your history. So what initially sparked your passion for cycling and climate science? How did you get into this? <laughs> So when I was in seventh grade, I remember sitting in my science class and my science teacher was talking about the greenhouse effect. And normally I never paid attention to my science professor, but for some reason on this particular spring afternoon, I like started listening to what he was saying about, you know, the molecules in our atmosphere and how they're greenhouse gas molecules and how this eventually is going to be a problem in our world. And it, it just stuck with me. And I mean, I, I could talk and talk about my history and you know why I'm so passionate about this and why the things I do just get me so excited because it is leading towards a better climate future and will help clean the air and all the things that we've touched on already. But I think that, you know, ultimately I feel like this is my calling and I was designed to work on this challenge. I love that. I love that. I love that you remember it back in seventh grade. I remember my seventh grade science teacher and they also had a big impact on me. Yeah. I like that it's your calling and that you're passionate about it. And I think that's going to fuel the work too. 
And I'm curious, are, do you feel like you are also passionate about cycling? And if so, like, how are you balancing the two? When I'm on my bike, I'm, I'm happy. It just makes me happy. And I, I think I said in an article interview recently that where I live, it's in the mountains of Colorado. And I feel a little bit like Snow White when I'm cycling because the like bunnies will run by and the birds will fly with <laughs> me. And it is kind of, you know, the elk will be off in the distance. I I've been in situations where the elk are trying to cross the road a little bit in front of me and I've stopped traffic to make sure nobody is like gonna disrupt their like tra crossing the street. And so being out on my bike, I feel more connected to just the experience of the world around me. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's a natural tie-in for you as the executive director of the Global Warming Mitigation Project. So I guess we'll start out by talking about the ride, which I am so curious about for so many different reasons. But tell us about the inspiration behind your 600-mile ride from Salt Lake to Sun Valley and back. So I work on international climate solutions, and my biggest contr contribution to greenhouse gases in our world are um, the, the miles I fly. And it's, it's hard to avoid that when you're in a job and a career like I am, but I'm trying not to travel as much and I'm trying to really pick my events and my places that I travel to very carefully. And when I was invited to the Sun Valley Forum to present our 2024 prize winners, I started thinking about, wow, is there a way I could get there by riding my e-bike? And it turns out that it's pretty far, but <laughs> I discovered that if I take the train for part of the ride, that I thought I could do it. And I was successful, even though it was quite difficult. I can't wait to hear so, more. Yeah, I want to hear more. I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of good stories in there as far it's so difficult, but I was curious, do you wind up planning your year more purposefully knowing that you want to reduce your travel for your job? And I would expect that's also probably on your mind for your personal travel as well. Yes, I try and do any kind of personal trips, maybe on the um, tail end or the front end of a business travel um, opportunity. It kind of ties in the flight. Last year after the International Climate Conference in Dubai. I met my daughter in the Maldives and we went to Singapore on my way home. So it was time spent with her and it was kind of part of the travel trip home. And yeah. you got to go to the Maldives in Singapore, which sounds absolutely incredible. <laughs> kind of <That's>, was. <laughs> I love, I like tacking things onto either side of a trip too, but I hadn't actually considered that's like saving me a trip as well. Like it's kind of help, you know, if I can start thinking of that a little bit more, that's really cool. So I do want to dive into though, like some of those challenges that you referenced is what were some of those biggest ones that you faced physically, mentally, emotionally? You know, I live in the mountains of Colorado and when we uh, were looking, my husband came with me and when we were looking at going to Sun Valley, you know, I didn't think that there would be 105 degree temperatures and a heat dome came in and the temperatures were much, much hotter than I train in and that I'm used to. So I was pretty terrified about that at first, but we did manage it with, you know, a lot of water, but that was something that was quite uh, kind of scary for me to be out mm -hmm. in, in the sun for 10 to 15 hours a day in those kinds of temperatures. And then train delays were very challenging. They didn't allow us to actually bike um, in the early hours of the morning, which I was hoping to avoid the temperatures. And the biggest challenge was finding the route. We had a, a very, we had so much difficulty with Google Maps not knowing where safe bike routes are. It doesn't seem like there's been enough mapping of these areas in like rural America. And what ended up happening is we had to ask people who were from that area and find people who knew the, the roads. You want to be on paved roads and loose gravel roads are the absolute worst. You can only travel about three or four miles per hour on a bike on loose gravel roads. Yeah, I'm a yeah. pretty avid gravel cyclist, but I can't imagine doing it fully loaded as like a bike tour. So that's pretty intense. And also back to the heat domes, I imagine that just makes the reality of the work that you're doing so much more real. You know, when you're faced with this 105 degree weather and you're trying to advocate for mitigation of climate change, it just all feels very real and in your face at all times. 
And it is a metaphor for what people are dealing with around the world, because most of the world's population does work outside. You know, a very big percentage of people in the world are out working in fields or, you know, working in the intense sun. And we have to remember that as we as humans are heating up the planet, this is going to become a more and more difficult and intense issue. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned previously that you live in the mountains of Colorado and you did some training. Can you talk to us a little bit more about the preparation for your long distance journey? I'm also curious to hear more about the train travel. Where did you pick up the train and then where did you bike? What did that logistic look like? Once I committed to doing this trip, I pretty much got on my bike every day or almost every day for at least some amount of time, whether it was just riding like a half an hour into town and back or, you know, going for a four or five hour uh, ride during the weekends. Um, I got on my bike as much as possible because most people who ride their bike know that it's a little hard on your body and certain parts of your body, like your bootay, can get, get pretty <laughs> sore. So I, I rode as much as I could, did some really hard rides and that helped a lot. And then as far as the train travel, we rode from um, our town to 40 miles away to a town called Glenwood Springs. And when we got there, the train was seven hours delayed, which um, was because oh of a derailment gosh. in, uh, I believe it was Illinois. And that really threw everything off from the very start of our trip. So we had to wait for the train to show up. We ended up not getting into Salt Lake City until about 6 a.m. We got on our bikes at 6.30 and our intention was to get on our bikes around one or two in the morning to try and beat the heat. It wasn't possible. We got on our bikes around 6.30 and the first day was so full of difficulties and learning curves and you know time outside in the heat that we ended up at that point having to ask people about the routes because we were in places that were just incredibly difficult to find our way and ended up running out of battery at about 10 p.m. that night and having to get oh some gosh. help to get to our first hotel. I have two follow-up questions here. One, are you still married? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer it. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but two, like for... Truly, like that community aspect of it and starting to ask around, how did that affect you? Fortunately, I'm fairly outgoing. So that was a really good thing because as we all know, men hate to ask directions. And so the <laughs> second day I said to my husband, I said, I'm going to go across the street to a diner and see if there's somebody there that can actually help us find a better route today. And he was like, okay, good luck with that. And so I went over there and the woman who owned the diner pulled out her Atlas map and she showed me where to go. And she said, I don't know why that, you know, that app is showing you where to go on that road. And it was very fun meeting her and talking to her. And when he did show up and engage with her, it kind of shifted the way he thought about how to engage with people and talk to them about what the area is like and what we can find. And, you know, after that, it just kind of kept rolling into more experiences with people, more conversations. And we really learned that we had to ask for help. It was really the only way to find our way. Wow. Yeah. How did you finally charge your batteries too? We would go to a restaurant or a diner or a gas station and just ask, you know, can we plug in here? And never did we get a no. Every single person said yes. Sometimes they would come out with a ladder to help us get to an outlet and help us like figure out where to charge in. And sometimes it would spur a conversation of what are you doing? Where are you going? Tell me about what you do for work. Um, I did talk to one young woman who was our server at a diner um, along the route. And she was so interested in the fact that I was going to a climate conference and that I was speaking about climate solutions. And she just loved listening to um, everything that we were doing as an organization and that we were doing on the bike ride. Yeah, so I was cool. going to ask. It is so cool. And I that was kind of my other thought about communities. You feel like you learned a lot. Do you also feel like you got that opportunity to educate people? Do you feel like the people you were interacting with have a different view of climate action now? that one young girl is an example of somebody who really quizzed me on what I do and things like that. And she 
found it so exciting. And in in my perspective, climate solutions are exciting. You know, they're exhilarating and they're the innovation of the future. And when people really pay attention, they get pretty jazzed about what we're doing and where we're trying to go and how that will lead to, you know, a better, cleaner, safer world. Yeah. Let's stay on this community topic and relating it back to your work, basically the role of community and climate activism and climate action. So what role do you see community playing in advancing climate action? It's super important. And, you know, I I tell people that ultimately there aren't that many corporations around the world that are the biggest levers in changing our entire atmosphere. You can go on all kinds of websites and find the list of the biggest corporations that are responsible for the 80% of our carbon emissions. Those are the ones that need to change. But everybody knows that a corporation is not going to change just because they want to, or just because it's the right thing to do. They're going to change because people put pressure on them to change. And whether that's pressure of sales or pressure of their employees with like employee advocacy or shareholder activism or economic pressure, you know, these are the kinds of things that'll make a corporation change along with like government mandates and regulations and also trade pressures. You know, if if all the island nations in the world said, we want no more single use plastic at all, that will put pressure on the companies who are making these like plastic bottles to maybe find a different solution. So communities and the people who are, are living there and who see the negative impacts of what's happening That's what's going to change this. They have to understand that their voice does really matter in the transition to the future. I like your example of all of the island nations because it feels a lot like the smallest voices could have a big impact in this. I immediately go, I don't know how big of an island nation you're talking about, but even if it's up to Japan, like that's still not what we think of as a world influencer in these kind of really big topics. Not that everyone can't do it, but it's by thinking of these nations who you don't normally think about. It's every little action can have a difference. And, you know, when these groups have alliances and they can work together and they can say something, let's say there was this island alliance and they said, our island is overrun with fossil fuel plastic products. And Make them from different things, make them from seaweed, make them from, you know, alternatives to plastic, which there are lots of. These big plastic producing corporations would have to listen because it's very similar to the example of, you know, when California does something in like their car standards, their automobile standards, the whole world has to change. Yeah. It's just the way trade works. California has the the critical mass to kind of sway this and that and then thinking more of the ways that we can all bond together as community members and feeling like if you are one person how do you find your community how do you find that collective voice to start asking for these changes and and california does seem like really big to us it is one of the world's biggest economies but if you talk to somebody who's let's say at one of the biggest beverage corporations they're not going to have two different types of like plants and supply chains for you know, yes, we're going to make our fossil fuel plastics. And then yes, we're going to make our alternative plastics. If a certain number of people say we want these alternative plastics, that's where they'll go because it's too expensive to have two different types of supply chains, et cetera. And that is the example of why like GM and Ford are switching to these electric vehicle assembly lines, because there is enough pressure for them to actually do that. And they, they need one type. They can't really have a variety. Yeah. Let's bring it back to the bike ride, if that's okay, and how it the bike ride ties into your work. There's a note in here about a 911 miracle. So tell us about the most memorable moments of your trip. You know, I had a couple interesting memorable moments that had to do with police officers. And there were like several of them that were kind of interesting. As as a matter of fact, one sheriff in Northern Utah asked us if we were homeless, which was kind of funny. But the specific, very memorable call that happened was we were on a gravel road in Idaho and we'd started off on pavement. It turned to gravel. It was a terrible gravel road. We were going about three or four miles per hour. I'm sure my husband was super mad at me. I was about a hundred feet ahead of him. 
And my phone, which is in the back of my jersey, which you have in a on a bike, like a back pocket, starts ringing. And I think it's him. And I think he's going to be like, why are you going this way? Because there was a <laughs> Y in the road. Google Maps had told me to go right. So I was planning on going right. I pull out the phone and it's not him. It's an unknown caller. And I just silence it because I think it's a spam call, put it back in my pocket and it rings again. And I pull it back out and it's actually a call from the town we had just spent the night in. And so I think maybe we left something at the hotel. So I answer it and it's the sheriff from that town or the, the police officer from that town. And he's, are you okay? Did you call 911? And I'm looking at my phone and I'm like, I didn't call 911. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And he goes, we got a call from you a minute ago. Are you safe? And I was like, yeah, I'm a little lost now that I have you. <laughs> you <laughs> let me know which way to go. And he asks me the questions they have to ask. You know, can you yeah. talk? Are you safe? All this kind of stuff. And then... <laughs> He's, oh, I see where you are. Oh, yeah, yeah. He goes, if you go to the right, it's about eight miles to the paved road. But if you go to the left, it curves around and it's about a mile to a paved road. And then you go, and I was like, oh, well, okay, thanks. And so I went to the left. We found the paved road in a mile. And I still have no idea how my phone somehow called 911. And I felt like it was some kind of miraculous divine intervention. Wow. No kidding. I'm glad you were safe and didn't actually need to call 911. And what a nice officer to help you out that way. Yeah. This, though, does bring up a little bit of the question of like infrastructure. And you have mentioned this already that like the cycling infrastructure to get you from here to there is lacking. And not only because Google doesn't know, which, by the way, is a catchphrase that my husband and I use a lot when we travel, like outside of the Outside of any common city, it's just, yeah, Google doesn't know. <laughs> anyway, is there something about the infrastructure that you think could improve? You know, I've done a tiny bit of cycling, like e-biking in the south of France, and it's super easy to get around because people are driving a little slower on the roads. And I was thinking in northern Utah about how the landscape was similar to the South of France. You know, you see a lot of the same foliage and it's quite beautiful, but we have huge trucks driving on the road. Like our American mm -hmm. kind of system is just build, go, you know, make more consumerism. And it, it feels to me like that's what the infrastructure is just all built around. And what I would love to see in, you know, a more climate-friendly future is, is more of this kind of, slow down, um, live with people who are on bikes, have more bike paths developed, have more roads where there are, are cafes and where it feels more just aligned with this idea of slowing down and enjoying your day. Instead of getting in your car and driving somewhere and just picking up your lunch in a bunch of to-go boxes, Maybe you bike there and and sit down at a nice nice cafe and you know enjoy the summer sun. That sounds like I, a really nice future that I want to live in. Sounds idyllic. Sounds fantastic. Yeah. It reminds me too of the Netherlands. They have a whole cycling infrastructure with road signs on the bike paths that can connect you to pretty much anywhere you want to go. But I think too the point you made about there's commerce to be had here. There's tourism. There's day to day that is just. I wonder how difficult it would be to get this up and running. So I like that you've spurred this idea for us. And not just the idea of having this, but the whole idea of how it helps communities with emotional fitness, mental fitness, and also physical fitness. They all are a part of this idea of having a quieter, more centered, and more connected future. Yeah, bikes are such an incredible connector because you can't not talk to people when you're on a bike. It's just a natural kind of extension of the way that you are getting around. So it makes a lot of sense. I am curious. So you did this trip on e-bikes, is that correct? 
Yes. Talk to me about how you planned battery range, charging. You've mentioned you charged, you know, as needed at gas stations and grocery stores and diners, but we don't often hear a lot about long distance bike travel on e-bikes, I think because of the battery question. So talk to us about that. How did you mitigate that? How did you plan for it? And how did it end up working out? Did the the e-bike work as well as you were hoping? One of the ways we plan for it is when we did train, you know, we we tried to train in a way where if we had no battery, we would be able um, to get there or ride our bikes with our just physical power. But that's really hard because we did pull a trailer. My husband did say, you know, we're doing this authentically. We are not getting extra batteries. We're not going to have a, you know, a savior vehicle to rescue us. And there were times when it was very difficult, but, you know, he said at one point, if we have to knock on somebody's house to get, you know, some power, he, he's unprepared to do that. We we never did have to knock on somebody's door, but we definitely would try and plan for at least double the amount of range needed in order to get somewhere because pulling a trailer and the heat and hills and winds are all factors. And you can't necessarily plan for that ahead of time. You kind of have to deal with it in the moment and overcharge. We didn't have throttle bikes and they do have a pretty long range. When mine's charged, it has 128 miles on power level one. Wow. So that's a pretty great range. And that was something that we actually made sure we always had, you know, as much range as possible, but we did run out of battery one time and that was where we had to be rescued on the side of the road. Yeah. That's what pretty impressive. Kind of, I was just going to ask what kind of bike, like how heavy is your bike at that point? Like my e-bike without power is like 50 pounds. It feels like I'm cycling through molasses if the motor turns off. Yeah. Mine is the same and okay. it's heavy. <laughs> yeah. I feel like you must have gained 10 pounds of leg muscle. <laughs> what were you going to say, Marley? I was going to ask, you know, long distance bike travel might not be an option for everybody. So what are some other practical steps folks can take to reduce their carbon footprint if they're not, you know, they don't have the time in their schedule or maybe they don't have an e-bike to bike 600 miles to a conference and back? Do you have any other tips folks can take in? You know, there's everyday life and there's lots of things we can do in everyday life. Um, the most important thing that uh, we're seeing right now is talk about it. Talk about climate. Talk about it being important. Talk about it being important to you, to your children, and to the future. Um, once people start talking about it and realize it doesn't have to be a wedge issue, that it's a survival issue, mm -hmm. it becomes a little less, I think, intimidating and learn more about it too. But when I travel, I pack a tote bag with me at all times. I have my water bottle. I have my coffee cup. So I don't get the extra stuff. I even have a little spoon fork thing that I put in my purse. And if you get in the habit of it, you know, it, it, it feels empowering to some small extent. And then when you choose travel solutions, if time isn't the biggest factor, try and choose something that's, you know, a train or carpooling or things like that kind of just keep that in your consciousness. And when you're ordering at a restaurant, try and choose things that maybe have not traveled as far because everything that travels is part of a carbon footprint. And, you know, maybe buy wine that's produced locally or something like that. So there's all if these I kinds must. of things that once you start talking about it, you start thinking about it. And once you start thinking about it, you start acting on it. Yeah. Oh, I love mm -hmm. that. I mentioned previously that I worked professionally in sustainability for probably five or six years. And these were all the things that we talked about all the time. It might not feel like you're making a difference when you take your water bottle or you take your coffee cup, but if six billion of us start doing that, it's going to make a difference. That's exactly what it is. And that's what the talking about it, that's where it starts and it, it can grow and grow. And that's what needs to happen. We need to grow the momentum. Yeah. You know, not everybody is so lucky to have such a natural tie-in for that. Do you have any tips for folks looking to combine their professional work with their personal passions for a cause? You know, it's not always possible because we have a job and sometimes we have to keep our job in order to keep a salary and, you know, all the things that are tied to that. But I do think if you can find, you know, something that you really love or even really doing it, it makes you continue doing it. You know, you, you can't necessarily have a new year's resolution that you're going to stick to if you can't stand it, if you hate it. So if you love what you're doing, it actually brings out the best in you. 
if you're in a situation in your career where you don't love it and you're never going to love it, then what you should do is you should find free time in your life where you do engage in something that you love because then you'll stick to it and you'll be good at it. That totally makes sense. That's where I want to be someday. Can you be my hero? I want to give you a minute to to talk about anything that might be coming up with the Global Warming Mitigation Project, anything that you're particularly excited about coming this fall. So the conference I went to, we announced the winners of the Keeling Curve Prize. And we do this every year. We have 10 winners for the Keeling Curve Prize, which is our annual award. We give out $50,000 to projects around the world or programs that are working to reduce, remove, and replace greenhouse gases. The application to apply for this prize is November 1st. So it's coming up pretty soon. And it's very exciting to be a part of sort of our global family, because as a winner of the prize, there are lots of other benefits. And then even being in our database uh, connects you to services and potential opportunities in the future where we are trying to figure out how to change voluntary carbon market portfolios and get more money to flow into the space of climate solutions. Very cool. Very cool. Um, And this might be, it's not a dumb question because I know I'm wondering it myself. Can you give me a one minute rundown on the Keeling curve? So the Keeling curve is the precise measurement of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And it's been measured since 1958. Uh, The original um, postdoctorate student that was measuring this CO2 in the atmosphere and an observatory in Mauna Loa um, was named Charles David Keeling. And he um, convinced his university to continue this data set. And it is it has been continued since 1958, and it um, precisely measures the CO2 in our atmosphere. There are many other places around the world that measure this now, but that is a um, symbolic reference to the greenhouse gas increases in our world. Thank you for that. I know we've all seen, you know, it's 421 parts per million and anything over, I I forget the exact number. It's been a long time since I dove deep into this work, but I think we've all heard of the Keeling curve, but thank you for explaining that. So man, that prize sounds really cool in it. That that is the applications are open to individuals, groups, nonprofits, I'm assuming kind of all across the board. Yes, it is for concepts projects and programs that are running. It is not for ideas. You can go on our website at gwmp.org and learn all about it. We have a FAQ section and we have the application opening soon. Very cool. Oh, that makes me really excited. We're kind of coming to the end of the interview now. So just a couple of like reflective type questions for you. So looking back, you just recently finished your bike ride. What are some of the key lessons that you learned from it? You know, I learned that people are the power. They sustained us. You know, they kept us excited and happy about what we're doing. They made the experience really meaningful. I feel like I do it again. I love the idea of being on a bike and being able to inspire others. And I'm really glad that I got a chance to do it. I'm really glad you did too. What an incredible experience. And it has just been an absolute joy to chat with you today. Thank you for telling us about the work that you're doing at the Global Warming Mitigation Project. We will have a link to that website. This is kind of a new topic for the All Bodies on Bikes podcast to dive into. So thanks for being a great bridge to it and really connecting bikes and low carbon travel to this much bigger global conversation that is happening and needs to happen right now. Thank you so much for having me.